Hello there, and welcome back to the Showing Up to Life podcast and YouTube channel. My name is Art Burns. And I'm really happy to be here with you today. I'm really excited, as always, to be here with you. Although, you know, I, I say this often, right? There's excitement, right, which which follows, really, an enthusiasm, right? I make myself excited to do these, right? And that's not to say that I'm I'm faking it in any way. What it means is that... You know, I don't necessarily wake up and say, oh, man, am I pumped to do a podcast episode. Sometimes I do. <laughs> Let me be very clear. Sometimes I wish I could do it at night, but I'm a little too tired. And, you know, but I'm so excited that I, I really like really excited for it. However, when there are times where I'm not excited, like just not naturally motivated by a, a spontaneous excitement, if you will, I have enthusiasm that generates excitement, right? Because I've, I've committed to doing it. And, 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 you know, when it arises, it's a question of it, it, it doesn't have to be a certain way, right? It doesn't have to be a certain level of feeling in my body in order for me to do a uh, perhaps successful or otherwise, um, you know, uh, uh, podcast episode, which is to say that, we can be, you know, if, if we look at the word enthusiasm, we can kind of see how enthusiasm contains a bit of curiosity, right? Because if I'm enthusiastic about something, I want to know more about it. I want to, I want to dive into it. I want to turn into it and turn towards it and, and see what it really is. And now if I only wait until I'm excited, well then, and, and, I, and I decide not to do it when I'm not excited, well, then that's a form of judgment, right? That's a form of labeling and categorizing something. And the minute I label and categorize something, I've, I've closed down the potential. I've, I've lost something in that process. I've lost something very, very important in that process. And so, so the idea of, of excitement, if we look at the idea of excitement as following the idea of enthusiasm, when we look at enthusiasm as sort of following the idea of curiosity, well, then we can rest in the confidence that we can always manage to get ourselves into a place of, you know, readiness and, 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 and you know, that, that energy that we need for whatever it is that we need to do, whether it's, you know, doing a podcast or maybe it's making a presentation at work or maybe it's just making a phone call that you don't want to make. Maybe it's writing an email to somebody, whatever that thing is, we can generate the energy in order to get it done. And again, it starts with the curiosity. And really, I could even back it up a little further and say that it starts with the awareness of either curiosity or judgment, because these are the two sort of, um, you know, opposing sort of energies with this, right? <laughs> like, like we could say that in a very important way, curiosity could be, could be seen as the opposite of judgment and vice versa, <laughs> okay? And so when we bring the awareness to our moment-by-moment -moment experience and we notice when we're judging, when we're categorizing, when we're putting things into a little box, and we recognize that that is the opposite of curiosity, and that that is not going to lead to a level of excitement. Sometimes it will. To the things that we judge as good, it will lead to excitement. However, that excitement is going to be an excitement that is also, you know, tinged and, and infused with a sense of, of, of fear and, and, and clinging. And, and well, what if it doesn't go wrong? I need it to go right now. I need it to, to be excited. I need the energy to be a certain thing. That's also part of the delusion. And, and every time we get into that, that place of the judgment that comes from that delusion and that, that ultimately causes the, the aversion and the clinging, we're always going to experience a negative set of emotions, a, a tension in our body, and a, and a pessimistic and, and, and critical, you know, not in the sense of critical thinking in a, you know, balanced and, and informed thing, but, but criticizing and, and, and judging ourselves and being pessimistic and being catastrophizing. That's ultimately what's going to arise from it. So, so whatever it is, the ultimate thing that we're doing, we start with that, just that very, you know, brief, infinitesimal moment in which we judge it, 
or categorize it, or we don't judge it and don't categorize it. Now, I, this is a little bit of a tangent, yes. <laughs> As you know, I'm not scripting any of this, um, but but I, I think it sort of relates to what I wanted to come in here and talk to you about today. And, and first of all, I, I'm realizing that, you know, I don't know if I'm doing uh, anybody any favors in doing this, but I did a casual Fridays episode this morning on Saturday because I wasn't able to do it yesterday. And so I'm posting two podcasts today. So I hope you're catching both of them. All right. So... <sighs> What I wanted to talk to you about today, and, and this does really relate into that that sense of, of, you know, not maybe so much the judgment and curiosity, but but more so the, the clinging and the aversion, right? And, and what I wanted to talk to you, and I know I'm using the word right a lot today, and I, I hear it. <laughs> I just want you all to know that I have the awareness, I'm, I'm sensing it. What I wanted to talk about today is talking about our work. And I don't mean our work in, tense, in terms of, you know, what we do for a living or the tasks involved in our job or, or the, the motivations or the philosophies or anything like that that, that surrounds the quote-unquote work we do, which translates into the money we make, which translates into the food and the travel and all the stuff that we do, right? Mm, there it is again. <laughs> Um, but what I'm talking about when I say our work, I mean the practice, our spiritual work, our, our practice of mindfulness work, our, our practice of, of compassion and kindness and, and empathy and, and moment-by-moment non-judging awareness. That is what I'm referring to when I say work in this context. Now, we have this tendency, and, and it doesn't just apply to this. It could also apply to your work in terms of your internal philosophies and worldviews that you're developing, your politics, your religion. It could also apply to um, if you're on a diet or you're in a uh, going to the gym and you're you're um, you know whatever else you you picked up a new hobby that you're working on. You're doing a painting. You're writing a song. You're writing a poem. Any of that. All of that falls into what I'm calling the work. And I want to talk about how and when (laughs) and if it's appropriate to talk about that work with other people. Now, here's the thing. I think it's very important or very, very helpful to have one person or a small group of people with whom we can talk about this work. I think that's very valuable. However... I think more often than not, we do ourselves a disservice when we discuss these aspects of our internal life, if you will, with the people around us. Now, and it's not, I don't say, um, you know, just the people who are close to us or just the people who aren't close to us. You know, it's, it's not about that because actually sometimes the people who are closest to us are the last peoples we want to talk to about this, this stuff that we're doing. And let me tell you why. When we're on the path of whatever it is, again, let's say it's you're on a diet, right? You, you, you found this new diet that you're going to try and, you know, promises that it's going to get you the goals that you want, whether it's fitness or health or weight loss or whatever it is, right? And as you start this diet, right, that is a, that is a journey that you are on. And, ju- and, and again, it's, it's often, whether it's a diet, a gym membership, a, a, a meditation practice, whatever it is, it is usually very, very helpful even learning music or reading books, like book clubs, right? It's, it's very helpful to have someone with whom we are sharing this journey. And that's where my role as a coach comes in. Okay, because because we're, you know, when when we do have a sort of companion or a comrade, if you will, in the process of this thing that we're doing to grow, you know, having somebody to help hold us accountable to the journey is very, 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 very helpful. I mean, it's it's invaluable. Because there are times during the journey, whether it's a diet, a meditation practice, going to the gym, whatever, painting a painting, writing a book, there are times where it feels, ah, I can't do this today. And this actually brings me back to what I 
was talking about in the intro, and this was not planned, but 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 those moments arise. Those moments where you're not feeling intrinsically motivated and 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 just naturally excited for it. There are times where you will feel that natural excitement, but there are times where you will not. And so having someone to whom you are accountable to it helps to motivate you in spite of that lack of of um, excitement. And that is where we get back to what I was talking about before, where you can, you can, if you have somebody motivating, it's, it becomes like, or holding you accountable, it becomes like, you know, not doing it is not an option, <laughs> right? I can't just not do it because that person who I'm accountable to is going to hold me accountable. So therefore, Right, having that person to hold you accountable, and that can be yourself. I mean, do not get me wrong. I mean, it is possible to motivate ourselves and to hold ourselves accountable, but that requires some discipline. <laughs> it really does, and and for some people, that discipline isn't there. And if that is the case for you, and that's this is part of non-judging awareness of ourselves, to be honest with ourselves and to say, yeah, I am not the person who who does this stuff on my own. I can't. I'm not able to motivate myself. That's okay. It doesn't mean that you're bad. It doesn't mean that you're broken. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means that you just lack a level of skillfulness. And in this case, the skillfulness would be the discipline to motivate yourself. But all you got to do is practice and you'll develop the skill. And so if, if holding yourself accountable is something that is a struggle for you, there's no need to struggle with it. <laughs> right? You can hire someone to help you. You can ask a friend. You can, you know, but again, now that's where we get back to my new point. If that person who you're hoping to to hold you accountable is not also invested in the same process, well, then it becomes very tricky and it becomes very confusing. And this is what I want you to be careful of. Because sometimes even whether we have somebody to motivate us or we're looking for somebody to motivate us or we're just naturally motivated anyway, <laughs> when, we're, when we're in these things, right, whether it's the, 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 even an educational process, right, when you learn something new, you want to share it with people. When you're doing your meditation practice, you want to tell people, oh my gosh, I got to tell you what I'm doing. This is amazing. When you're going to the gym, hey, I want to tell you about the gym. It's so fun. The aerobics class, the spinning class. Let me tell you about the teachers. It's a natural instinct that we have. But there's a danger to this. And there's a, there's a, a very important sort of peril that we should be looking for or, or be, be protecting ourselves and, and building boundaries so that we can stay safe in this work that we're doing. And again, this really definitely applies to the work that I talk about here, but it applies to a lot of other things too. You know, the gym, the, the hobbies, the painting, all this stuff. Because the problem is that when, when we tell somebody about it, right, that was an intentional right, by the way. <laughs> when we tell somebody about it, right, <laughs> we are opening ourselves up. And, and, and well, let me say this first. When we tell somebody about anything, they are taking what we are telling them and they are associating it and processing it into their own worldview, into their own reality of the moment, which includes their emotions, their physical sensations, the story going on in their mind right now. So for instance, on a very simple, um, a very simple level, right? If we, if we say that, you know, oh, I, I just started this meditation practice. Yeah. And, and the person we're telling, you know, maybe they got some, some really difficult news this morning about a, a promotion at their job that they're not going to get. Well, they're feeling very pessimistic in this moment. They're probably feeling the, the you know, the pessimism is creating a, 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 an emotion in their body that is negative. It's, it's, it's fearful or it's, it's grief or it's, it's worry or it's, you know, 
sad. You know, it could be any of those and all of those. And then, of course, there's a tension in their body that follows that emotion, which has created this whole cycle for them. This is something I've talked about a lot, so I'm just very briefly touching on it. If you have any questions about this, let me know, and I'll point you to some of the other episodes I've talked about this or just tell you about it again, (laughs) because I talk about this all the time. And that's the thing. I have a lot of practice talking about this. So no matter what's going on with somebody else, I can manage them because that's what we're doing here, right? That that when that was not an intentional, right? (laughs) When when I tell somebody this, that message that I'm giving them is coming into whatever they're experiencing. So as I said a minute ago, right, you have this person who's, you know, just found out they didn't get a a promotion and therefore the the story in their mind is pessimistic. The emotions are feeling negative and fearful, et cetera. And the tension in their body, they're feeling not well, right? They're not feeling relaxed and comfortable. Now, when I say, and, and it could be very, very subtle, right? This doesn't mean that, you know, I'm, I'm walking up to somebody who's shaking and crying and, and telling them about my meditation practice, right? It, it, that was also not intentional. <laughs> that, that, you know, I might not notice all of this that's going on with this person. They're just being them. And, and all this that I'm talking about is happening internally. So they could still be smiling and, and, and you know, kind of faking their way through it. As I tell them, I almost said right there, as I tell them about the the practice that I'm doing. But without my knowledge, this this message about my practice is coming into this, this negative cycle that they're experiencing. So then their response is going to be within that negative cycle of experience that they are having right now. Which is to say, with this specific person we're talking about, they're going to say something like, oh, well, how long have you been doing it for? And it's not working yet? Or they'll say, oh, yeah, my friend tried meditation and after like six months, she realized it was a complete waste of time. Or, oh, well, I heard that, you know, transcendental meditation is much, much better than mindfulness meditation. And now, again, this could be about whatever, right? Like, hey, I just started writing a book. Yeah, well, you know, everybody writes books. You know, it's a question of whether you get published. How are you going to get somebody to publish your book, right? And so the point is that all that enthusiasm and all that excitement that you had just like, right, like air coming out of a balloon. And now you are in a place of pessimism, catastrophizing. Oh my gosh, is everything I thought was right about this is actually wrong? Oh my gosh, I've wasted all my time. Oh my gosh, this is all terrible. I'm failing again. Oh my gosh, I can never get anything right. Nothing I try is going to make me happy. I'm going to be sad for my whole life. (laughs) And then the emotion from that is going to be fear and regret and grief and all that. And then you're feeling in your body, a a, a pit of the stomach feeling, a a tension in the chest, maybe a little twitch in your eye. You're going to feel this. And now your practice has been, in a very real way, contaminated by all of this. You have been driven off your path. You have suffered here. Now, Remember, a moment ago, I mentioned that I have the skill of doing this. I talk about this stuff all day, every day. I mean, even to all of you hundreds of people out there who who could potentially be listening to this right now, I, I, I could get up in front of a room full of people and talk about this. Or in any individual conversation, I could talk about this. And when somebody came back with that negative aspect, that that negative response and that, you know, that pessimism and the negative emotions and all that that I discussed, I am able to keep myself, you know, insulated from that. That doesn't creep into my mind. That doesn't, you know, shake my confidence. It doesn't, it doesn't rattle my enthusiasm because I've practiced. That's the only reason why it doesn't happen to me and it might happen to some of you just because I've practiced. It doesn't mean that I'm some kind of otherworldly, you know, like looking at like a, you know, like with skillfulness, it's it's tricky, right? Like we can look at, say, you know, I could learn how to throw a football really well, right? 
but I'll never be like seven feet tall and 300 pounds and be able to go out there on a football field and actually do something, right? Like I cannot, like in a professional NFL football game, right? I would be killed. <laughs> I mean, truly, like I might not survive. So yes, there is a certain level that that skillfulness only takes you so far, right? So, so I just want to be very clear about that, right? But but the point is though that there is no innate, you know, ability. There is no innate like you don't have to be a, a, a you know world class physical specimen of an athlete being you know six foot nine and three hundred pounds and you know one percent body fat, right? Like that is that doesn't apply to this kind of stuff. And so I tell you that to encourage you that it really is a matter of practice. And, and it's two practices, really, right? It's first, it's the practice of your practice, whether, again, whether it's the meditation practice or writing a book or painting a masterpiece or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, as you continue to do that thing, you cultivate more confidence in yourself, you cultivate more confidence in your awareness and your ability to discern and, and your ability to know that you're on the right path. Even though, and, and part of that confidence, a really important part of this confidence, and, and one of the core, you know, very, you know, absolute vital skills of mindfulness is being okay with not knowing right? It's being okay with, with, you know, feeling like, yeah, I might not have all the answers. You know, maybe I am wrong about something. And that is really where the difference between, you know, getting triggered by what somebody says and not getting triggered by what somebody says. It's not so much in the fact that I just know so much that, oh, I'll never be shaken. I, you know, nobody knows as much as me. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's actually kind of the opposite of that. It's the ability to say, well, maybe I don't know what I think I know. You know, and everything, everything that we can be aware of, there's sort of three spheres. There's the one sphere that is what we know. Then there's a larger sphere <laughs> that, that is what we know we don't know. And then the largest sphere of all of them is that we don't know what we don't know, right? And so part of the practice of mindfulness, and and this can be carried out to everything else we do, is that what we call the beginner's mind, is approaching everything that, wait a minute, even though I think I know everything about this, maybe there's, I don't know, right? Maybe I don't even know what I don't know about this, and, and, and that is where, again, we go back to non-judging awareness. Am I going to judge the fact that I don't know something? Well, then that has nothing to do with this that we're talking about here, right? It has nothing to do with whatever the thing is. If I'm, if I'm feeling like it's bad that I don't know everything, it has nothing to do with my knowledge of the thing. It has to do with my clinging to an idea or my aversion to a different idea. My aversion to ignorance, perhaps, or my clinging to being the smartest guy in the wor in the room, if you will. Not that I've ever been the smartest guy in the room, at least not, not that I've told anybody else about. <laughs> but, but the point is that, that if I'm clinging to one of those things, then I'm going to have that negative reaction to that. But the, the reaction to that is not whether I know something or don't know something or whether I'm right or I'm wrong. It's, it's in my rigid attachment to being right. That's where the suffering comes from, which is, again is part of the practice. <laughs> So all this to say, and this is a very ranging uh, episode today, um, but but I just, you know, it, it just is, I think it's very important, and, and I, I just wanted to kind of take some time to, to talk about this with you, because, you know, I, I think for a lot of you, you're probably learning new stuff through this, and, and I'm hoping that you have started a, a practice of some sort. I don't know what it looks like, and it doesn't have to look like anything particular, but I hope that you are taking some of these practices and applying them into your moment-by-moment -moment experience. And as you're doing that, again, <laughs> to re refresh what, or rehash what we said, is that you're going to want to, you know, you're going to have that drive to tell your sister and your 
father and your friend and your, you know, your coworkers and your cousins, and you're going to have this, this drive to do that. And, and at certain points, it's safe to do so, right? And that was unintentional. <laughs> but, but, but as you're going, you, you know, that is something to be aware of. And that is something that becomes the practice itself. As I want to say this, what if they say something really negative back to me? Am I in a place where I can handle that? Am I in a place where I can keep that at arm's distance? Or is that going to shake me? And again, you can only ask that question in the honesty of non-judging awareness. Because if, if I'm judging, and I almost said it there again, if I'm judging that, well, then I'm going to tell myself, yeah, I can handle it. If, if not being able to handle it is a bad thing, well, then, yeah, I can handle it, no problem, until I realize I can't, <laughs> right? Because just saying you can't doesn't mean that you actually can. And then when somebody does say something negative back to you, and then you're lost in this, this ocean of, of self-doubt and, and, and all kinds of hard, hard, difficult things that you're going through, right? It was, it was unnecessary, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if they know what you're doing or, they, or you, they don't know what you're doing. You're doing what you're doing. They're doing what they're doing. And if, again, if you want to share it and if you feel comfortable and, and confident, and, and that, again, is something to keep as part of the practice, at what point do you feel confident? And with which people do you feel confident? Because it's not just a monolithic, you know, public out there, right? And that's where I say that sometimes the family is the last people we want to tell about this stuff, depending on your family, of course. But your family is very, very close, you know? And, and just like a, a simple statement or a simple question carries so much subcontext to it that it can, it can rattle us. It can trigger us. Ram Dass used to say that, you know, well, well, Ram Dass, two things that Ram Dass used to say. First of all, he used to tell his students, when you feel that you've attained enlightenment, go spend Thanksgiving with your family <laughs> and then tell me how you feel. <laughs> I love that one. But, but as you know, part of that, that, you know, sort of vibe of Ram Dass, he, he would also talk about, um, you know, he would, he would say that when he came home from Thanksgiving, like from India, and he came to spend some time with his family, you know, his father would just ask a simple question like, do you have a job? <laughs> and that would send him into this, you know, complete reaction and stress and, and just, you know, completely throw him off and, and take him out of the present moment and, and just made him like like he hadn't done a single minute of practice even though he's practiced, you know, hours and hours and hours every single day since he saw his parents last like a year ago, right? So, so that's, that's where we have to, and, and again, that is part of the awareness that we're practicing. Is this person, is there such subcontext with this person that I'm going to read, you know, that what they say is not just what they say? And being aware of that is very, very helpful. And this is true for work. And, and this also says something about their motivation, the person who you're telling, who, what is their motivation, right? That was unintentional. Uh, if, if it's, you know, somebody who, you know, is the kind of person who needs to be that right person in the room, for instance, we all have, we all know who those people are. We, we have them around us. Most of us do, right? That one, the mansplainer. Yeah. <laughs> The one who always has to interject, yeah? Well, when we say something to him, or it's mostly him, I guess, <laughs> but him or her, it's, it's you know, we, we should expect, like, there's no reason for us to be surprised that they try to tell us something that we're wrong about this or something better, Right. And so that one also, I'm, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm sure this is annoying for some people, but that also, that right was not intentional. Uh, I'm really just working on this, folks. And I, I just, I, thank you for helping me with this. Um, but, but that is also part of the awareness. Yeah. That awareness is part, you know, that, that becomes the empathy, which as you all probably remember, there are five different types of empathy. 
There's the empathy that we feel, we resonate, right, which is called empathic resonance. But there's also the empathy of perspective taking. Can I put myself in their mind for a second? Then there's cognitive empathy, which is, can I follow along with the way they think? Then there's um, uh, compassion, uh, uh, empathic concern, which is pretty much a a, a synonym of compassion. And then there is uh, uh, empathic joy, which is the ability to feel someone's joy and to be happy with them, which is the same thing as suffering, uh, the same thing as compassion with suffering. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked. So I hope I hope this is helpful to you. I hope you all kind of I hope you're able to understand, <laughs> follow along because I feel like my uh, uh, this is a bit of a ricochet rabbit episode here. But I was just I, I was really just genuinely excited to to just get on and just tell you something. So so this is what I'm telling you. I hope it was helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, and I thank you again for all your support and and all of your 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 wonderful comments that I get and and seeing all the people who are listening and seeing where you are in the world and stuff. It just it tickles me. It really does. I just really love this. So thank you so much every one of you. All right everybody. I wish you well and I'll be back again soon. Take care.